Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, we spotlight in-depth interviews with legendary musicians and celebrities. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello, 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 everyone. I'm Ray Shasho. Welcome to the show where we interview legendary and up-and-coming music artists, celebrities, and authors. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Greg Voltz showed great skills in singing from a very early age. Being a self-taught musician, when he was only 13 years old, he started his own band called The Wombats. As he grew up, he went on to share the stage with the likes of Janis Joplin, Chicago, and others. 1970, he became a born-again Christian and started performing with several Christian bands. He formed a band called Gideon's Bible and later toured with a group known simply as E-Band, which was a part of the Jesus movement. E's only studio recording can be found on the rock musical 2LP album, Because I Am, released in 1973. After E broke up in 75, Vols moved to Springfield, Missouri, where he worked with legendary guitarist Phil Keggy. He also performed the lead role in a rock stage musical called Ezekiel. 1976, Volz received two of the most important calls of his life. First, he was offered the lead singing position of Ario Speedwagon. Volz, be, uh, being a recently converted Christian, declined. Six weeks later, he got the call to participate in Petra's second album, Come and Join Us. Although at the time he participated as a guest singer in just three songs, founder guitarist Bob Hartman, who at the time was sharing the lead singing duties with co-founder guitarist Greg Huff, offered Volz the full-time position. His first full-time album with the band, Washes Whiter Than, came in 1979, and therein came one of the most prolific periods of the legendary band. Volz remained the lead singer until 1985 when he left to pursue a solo career. Volz released his first solo effort, titled The River is Rising, in 1986 under Murr Records. He followed it with three other moderately successful albums. During this time, he also toured with Joe English and a band called Pieces of Eight. Volz's tours drew in the 1,000 to 1,500 range during this time, a very respectable number for a contemporary Christian artist, but nowhere near the level he experienced at the end of his tenure with Petra. In October 4, 2005, he rejoined Petra for the live recording of their last DVD, Petra Farewell. He joined the stage with current singer John Schlitt for a melody of ballads, and he followed it with a solo rendition of Grave Robber, which was one of his hits with the band. In 2010, he spearheaded the renewal of the classic members of Petra from the early 80s. Classic Petra was born. Greg X. Voltz, John Lowry, Louis Weaver, Mark Kelly, and Bob Hartman took the band on a two-year world tour with new recordings of the classic songs. In 2016, Greg, Louis, and John agreed to record another album of classic Petra songs and recruit the talent of former Petra member Roddy Cates, and former Pieces of Eight member, Kirk Henderson. Greg Bailey, another former Petra member, was asked to play bass on the 2018-19 tour. This new project is called CPR. Please welcome singer, songwriter, musician, producer, Greg Voltz to the Ray Shasho Show. Hello, Greg. I, I don't know what to say. I, I think almost, did I fall asleep during that whole deal? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> most people, I was gonna most say, people blah, do. Blah 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 blah. What are you doing now? <laughs> well, <laughs> but we are, we are doing something, and that's uh, it's kind of like I saw Mick Jagger's picture on the front of Rolling Stone in '75, and I thought I can do that. <laughs> I think so. Why not? <laughs> hey, we need you guys. We need you guys. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we are we're doing what we feel like uh, we're called to do. Um, 
course, the uh, the classic Petra thing that did last, you know, over a couple years, and and we we did go around the world. Uh, it was a whirlwind deal. It was very good, but um, it just uh, it, it just didn't it didn't work out for that group of guys. And um, I don't, I'm not I want to be nice here, but Bob really didn't want to play with the band anymore. He, he had some physical issues, and I think his wife didn't want him on the road. And anyway, so we laid it down for about six years. Right. Uh, but um, the the good part is is that. The, the calling on your life and what God has for you remains. So uh, things strangely but very interestingly uh, opened up. I was, um, I was in Nashville actually working on Carmen's last record, singing a few songs on his record to help him. I had a little time, went over to John Lowry's studio in Franklin, and um, just, just you know, we were conversing, and I said, John, you know, Louie and I are going to do another record. He said, well, I, I want to do it with you. I said, you know, I know Bob doesn't want to do it, and we don't even know where Mark is. But anyway, um, so let's pray about this. So we did, and I don't know, a couple months later, this friend of Louis of 20 years, who uh, actually was a broker. He had been a Nazarene pastor for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was going, Louis was going through San Antonio, and he saw Dave, and Dave said, Louis, I think the Lord wants you guys to do another record, so here's a check for $10,000 to get you started. And Louis called me and said, you know, what do I do? I said, take the money. <laughs> I called John Lyra. I, yeah, I called John Lyra. I said, John, I've got $10,000. He said, let's get started. <laughs> and uh, so Louis had been talking with Ronnie Kate, and Ronnie was all in, really was. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he's a, a good player and a good guy, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, he, I said, well, as far as the guitar player said, John said, uh, Greg, I got 12 guys here in Nashville that want to do this. I said, well, I'm sure that they do, but let's let's pray about this. So a few days later, I get an email that I never heard from this person, didn't know them, had no idea why they're emailing me. And I get many emails every day, but it's like this one caught my attention. And he said, uh, you know, dear Mr. Bowles, if, uh, if you're thinking about putting the band back together, think Kirk Henderson on guitar. And that was it. And I thought, yeah, I know that. That's a sign for me. So I sent it to Kirk, and Kirk had been like a music pastor for 20-some years, and it just mm-hmm. just turned over his position and started a family counseling ministry in Louisiana. And he said, are you, he said, are you kidding me? I said, no. He said, oh, yeah, I want to do it. So Johnny says, oh, that's a great, he's got an R&B feel. You know, he's a good singer. And... Uh, so we, you know, we just took about nine months to do the record, really, and uh, because it was, well, another story part, another friend out of nowhere, he just says, well, what do you, how's it going, blah, 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 blah. We said, well, I can, I can put 10000 in, bam, another 10000 Well, that's enough for production costs for us. Nobody gets right. paid, but we get the record done. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we're just about at the end of it, and John... John is talking to me, and he says, Greg, he said, I got five songs. Oh, if I could just have a string section. And I said, well, um, how much will that cost? And he said, well, you know, the A strings in Nashville are about 3500 for four hours. I said, I'll find the money. And I'm, I'm just spitballing. Mm-hmm. So two days later, I get a phone call for the, from a, an apostolic ministry that's actually one of my coverings, if I can say that correctly, uh, they pray for me all the time, but anyway, I've known this guy over 20 years. And he said, you know, Greg, uh, Dennis, uh, listen, you remember Tim, yeah. Well, we were talking about how's it going with the band. I said, you know, well, I said, well, Tim just got an inheritance. He wants to know if he can do anything for the band. I said, ask him if he can write a check for $5,000. <laughs> he said, I'll have it in the mail tomorrow morning. So the record is totally done. I mean, it's all paid for. We have no debt. And then it's like, okay, so what do we do? Uh, well, let's pray. What a concept, huh? Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't mean this. Let's, I don't want to be the manager, the booking agent, the travel agent, the, but I ended up with the job. So I'm basically handling what we do. Um, we've been doing dates. The band plays really good. I have four really strong singers. We do not play to click or stems. We just go out and do it like the old guys. And 
as a result, we can go places, we can change stuff, we can do what we want. And it, it creates a spontaneous atmosphere. You know what I'm saying? Right. So they don't know what's going to happen. I mean, mm-hmm. we do, but we don't. And uh, so anyway, we're on it again. And uh, I will say that Ronnie Cates, because of his schedule, just sent a lovely, you know, apology letter and said, guys, I can't, my schedule is not going to work for this. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and then Greg Bailey, who played on the record, um, who was the celloist on the record, John tells me, well, Greg, you know, I work with Greg Bailey all the time. I'm, I think he's the guy. I said, call him. Next day, Greg says, I'm in. As many dates as you want to do, I'm in. So we have four Petra members, or Petra, we have four former Petra members, but, you know, it's like a congressman. Once a member, always a member. Right, uh, right. And uh, Kirk is uh, it's so easy to work with, I, I'm not sure if sometimes like, hey, dude, <laughs> he's a Mississippi boy. Anyhow, it's going well. So that's the rundown of where we are today, but how we got there was, uh, ooh, for me, I don't mean I'm old, but, you know, I started this thing 53, 55 years ago. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And uh, my voice still works well. I can still hit the high notes. Your voice uh, is awesome. Uh, Thank you very much. Anyhow. We're talking, talking, of course, about the... uh, uh, your latest release, which which is... Gosh, I just lost it for a second there. Back to the Rock 2, right? Yes, Uh, it is. uh, is, uh, These are all songs that you uh, recreated again with the new band, right? With with CPR? We did. Uh, There are nine of the classic Petra songs, which, by the way, CPR actually stands for Classic Petra Revival. We're reviving the classic Petra music. Thank you for clearing that up. (laughs) And some people say, some people think it stands for cell phone repair. However... Uh (laughs) <laughs> we have a number of names we could call it, but uh, that's what it stands for. Now there is one. There's one song on this on this new release that uh, I felt was very appropriate. It's one that I had recorded thirty some years before. It's uh, it's an Aerosmith song, and Dream the name on. of it is Dream On. Yep. And uh, you know I've gotten mostly positive response from it. I get a few negatives. Why would you do that song? Well. Here's the, here's the story. The reason we're doing what we're doing is because we feel we have a mandate to reach prodigals. Mm-hmm. And prodigals are people that have been something once and are not anymore, and they're lost, and they're living in caves, running from mad kings. I mean, right. you know, and so anyway, even in 2010, when it first started, that whole band came back together again as I call a miracle mm-hmm. of uh, coincidences that were not coincidences right. that caused us to be able to go. And, and I felt like that the Lord spoke to me very clearly, and I hope it's okay to talk like this, but this is who I am. Sure. Uh, the Lord spoke to me clearly that there were millions of prodigals out there that, that could be reached by this music, but mm-hmm. they they had been lost through the cracks. They had just right. slipped through the cracks. And... It never was fulfilled. That call, that call was never fulfilled. So, and we saw, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds uh, respond to us and to the music uh, mm-hmm. during that time. And again, the same thing is happening. And I think that even more so now than then. Um, case in point, we're doing we're doing a pickup date in south of Columbus on our way to a festival, a uh, jazz festival up in New Hampshire in 2012. And it was like two-week notice. We There was a church that said, sure, come on. We had about a 1,000 people there. It was a really good turnout for two weeks. And at the end of the concert, this young man came up. I say young. Uh, this gentleman came up, <laughs> and he said, my name is so-and-so. He said, I have to tell you, um, I have two brothers that I have not talked to in 20 years because we are estranged. And all three of us ended up coming to this concert not knowing the other one was coming because mm. we grew up on this music. Right. And your message and, and your challenge to us tonight uh, has reconciled our family. 
And I thought, I don't think it gets any bigger than that, that's in my opinion. That's what it's opinion. all about. Yeah, that's what it's all about. So, um, you know, they didn't know. They show up mm-hmm. to music because, it, you know, music is timeless in, the, in yep. the soul realm. It really is. It is. Uh, and so we're seeing, and this is a new thing. This CPR thing, even though we're doing the, the classic Petra stuff, it's different. Mm-hmm. It's a different feel. Um, of course, the guys play very well. And um, we're actually, we're planning on another release of all original <clears throat> material next year. Awesome. Awesome, Greg. So, I got to. Um, I, I got to tell you. I got to tell you what I think about the album. Okay. Okay. First of first of all, I gave it five stars. I said it was an epic rock production with brilliant and compelling lyrical content. One of the very best Christian rock albums I've ever heard, and I really mean that. It's it's a, it's an awesome awesome album. I liked every track on it. Um, as far as favorites, they're all. I mean, I love the coloring song, of course. That's always been a favorite of mine. Your rendition of uh, Dream On is, is fantastic. I, I think you nailed it. Uh, it uh, did you uh, get any feedback from Steven Tyler? I haven't talked to him, uh, uh-huh. but I, I, I could. Uh, I do know this. I know that the guys like uh, Steve Perry and Lou Graham mm-hmm. and, and those guys... Uh, Carrie Livgren, they all they all right. listen to what we do, oh, uh, sure. you know, and, and and some of those guys I have contact with, right? Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's good to be an encourager, mm-hmm. and uh, you know I've you know I've been on, on the front end of this thing for a long time, and for whatever reason I still have the energy and the desire to keep doing this. I, I don't, I mean, as far as I did a show years ago. I was working with Pat Boone on a Celebrity Spectacular in Chattanooga, <laughs> really? Tennessee. Back in, oh yeah, Pat's a, Pat's a real. He's a good bro. Yeah. You know, he, we we play golf. He's we converse. He loves the music. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, so he did this thing to raise money for uh, uh, children's homes. About right. a dozen of them. There were a dozen mm-hmm. homes that had parents with six kids in each one. They were in a community. They went to school every year. He raised money. He'd do a two-day golf tournament and then a big thing at the Civic, and he'd have, you know, everybody in the world in. But he would bring me in for the kids. Like, he would have Clyde Foley coming. So I'm doing this, I'm doing a thing with Perry Como. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah. You're going way back. (laughs) Back in the day when I was, uh, when I was, thought I, when I thought I was something, (laughs) I used to go to Manhattan to buy my clothes down in South Soho. And... I would wear these really wild clothes. I mean, they were expensive, but I I love to wear wild clothes. And so I come out in this thing, this suit that's, you know, different. And, you know, I sing, and the, the kids are standing on the chairs, and the older people are just looking at them and saying, what, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I get done, and Perry Kilman comes out, and he starts, he's a comedian. He starts saying, man, he's, I had this great suit that I bought in New York, and I was going to wear it. Somebody stole it out of my dressing room. And the <laughs> whole crowd just cracked. And uh, so he's 78 years old, and he sings like a bird. And I'm yep. thinking, I can do that. So, uh, you know, you, you just don't know. Uh, yeah. You know, look at Tony Bennett. Come on. He's still around. Yeah, come on. So yeah. we're going to do what we do until we get, we're done. And the Good. reason... And when we know, we'll know we're done because we're dead. <laughs> <That's how> we <laughs> know we're done. <laughs> Everyone needs to get back to the rock too. I, I'm very sincere when I said it's one of the best, one of the best albums I've heard in a long time. Uh, the lyrical content, you know, Hollow Eyes, you know, Children's uh, Hunger yeah. is, is, is basically the theme on that one. It was a favorite. Uh, the coloring song, it has a very Renaissance feel to it, like prog rock. Love that song. It's a great song. Uh, Not of this world, which is you know, I mean, what, what kind that of that was a good we, one. Yeah, we are foreigners that, that came don't out belong. Really, yeah, that came out really good uh, to me. Oh man, I, I'm with it, you, it's Ray. Incredible. I liked all of them. I mean, I love it. Actually, it, when I don't listen to to music that I sing, mm-hmm. but there are times that I have. We'll have somebody over for dinner, and musicians and people that I know, and they'll say, "Well, we want to, we want to hear the, we want to hear this." 
So I will go into the studio room. It's a it's a bedroom, but it's really a studio. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and uh, oh gosh, let's see. Um, I just burned the bacon. Can you believe that? <laughs> burned the bacon. I like that. I burned the bacon. I thought I could get away with it, put it in the oven. And, and be, but, but no. That's funny. No, you got to burn the bacon. So That's this is going to have to go into baked beans, I guess. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm uh, a cook. I do all the cooking. Are you after. really? Oh. Are you the cook oh, in yeah, the family? 40, 40 years. Wow. And uh, it's just me and my wife now, but... And of course, when the grandkids come, that's a different deal. But yep, yep. Uh, yeah, sometimes you get distracted. You know, you get on a roll. And next thing you know, yep. you burn know. the bacon. Usually, it's the rolls. I know. <laughs> Usually, it's the rolls. <laughs> uh, another so, track, Ju- anyhow, Judas, uh, Ju- Judas Kiss. Uh, oh my! Yeah, the, 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 the guitar work on this album is also incredible. Judas Kiss, the opening, sounds a little bit like Jethro Tull in a way. It's it's an, well, another know, one of my I, favorites. I I just anyway, well, I was saying when I I have people over and they want to listen to it, I'm listening. I'm like, right, oh, guys, this is this is good, you know. It's and a you're great your album. own worst critic. You're probably the same way. You're your own yep, worst yep. critic. Yep. But um, uh, the response I've gotten from people, um, they say the same thing that you do. They think this is probably the best sounding. Definitely. And, uh, Content of a record of a Petra record put together that they've ever I think heard. So. I thought. Well, I, I agree. So it, we're going to get out there and do it. We did get a. Uh, we have a record company, a Lamont Records. It's been mm-hmm. I don't know. They've been together fifty five years. They're in Nashville. It's an independent label, but and they probably do mostly country. But we needed somebody to. Um, I didn't want to do the licensing and the royalties and all that stuff. I can't do it. I mean, it's too much for me. So right, yeah, it is too we, much. They just said, "Hey, uh, Dave, Dave Moody says, Greg, whatever you want to do, just tell me what you want what you want to do. I'll work whatever kind of deal you want to do." I thought, really? So wow, that's refreshing. So they they are uh, distributing, and they our website goes to their fulfillment department. People can get it at classic uh, CPR Band dot rocks. That is the okay. website CPR Band. Dot rocks, and they say, right. "Well, why did you get that? Why did you use that name?" Well, because CPR dot com was a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> really? Holy crap! And he said, I'm talking to my webmaster, you know, and this is just the way it goes. I said, "I said, Jim, so what do you got?" He said, "Well, he said I've got CPR band dot rocks for ten bucks." I said, "Grab it! <laughs> I take it." <laughs> so, so, so that's what we have, and it really fits the band, I think. Yeah. It does. You know, because it's just what we do. Yep. Um, Greg Bailey is going to be carrying an uh, electronic cello with him. Well, it's electric cello oh, with wow. him on the road. Cool. Um, he's a really good celloist. I mean, but it just adds a whole other dimension. And we are getting ready to do another television special November 4th and 5th in Orlando, mm-hmm. Florida. Awesome. So that's a good thing, too. We're playing, you know, we've got some dates coming up. And, Yep, uh, a big big date in Lakeland, the twenty first. We're looking at yep. St. Louis in October. We're looking in Kentucky in November. I, it's just weekends, and uh, you know the guys, the guys are still kind of you know you're you're still busy. They got stuff going. It's like until right. you know if maybe a, a tour game together with another act as a, du- mm-hmm. a double bill or something. We'll probably just continue to work weekends. And, well, the the, the uh, show coming up in Florida, it, you know, that's only about an hour. For me, you know, I'm I'm well, south. Well, you got to come. Yeah, I'll, I'll, it's it's I'll classic Petra with David and the Giants. I just talked to David Huff recently, and uh, I've, I've also talked to Keith Thibodeau. Like he was on oh, the show. Yeah, sure. So it's uh it's coming up September 21st at Victory Church in Lakeland, Florida, and it's part of the Back to the Rock World Tour, which which is going to be a great show. Well, actually, it's a great facility too. They have really good sound and lighting and um uh, of course they if they have to move it into the the, the bigger venue they can right. but uh it all looks good i've talked to uh the promoter who said that i he said i'm getting response from oklahoma kentucky tennessee uh, louisiana georgia he said they're coming from all over with this i'm thinking what so obviously he's doing a good job 
what I, I went to the site. I mean, they they have a lot of different uh, you know uh, shows, different kinds of shows, and I, like you said, I think they got a few different venues there, right? Different sizes. Yeah, they do. Venues. They do. Yeah, yeah. It's a great. So we're we're too, looking. For, we're looking forward to that. That should yeah. be. Uh, that should be a fun thing, and then we'll do uh, the the um, the taping in November, mm-hmm. which is a brand new facility. It's TBN uh, facility, but it's brand new, state of the art. The whole back wall is LED. I mean, it's it's going to be like a real deal. So now, uh, where's that? Not at? that the last one was not bad. The last one was good too. But uh, is that the one in Orlando or uh, the new ones in Orlando? The last one was in Tennessee, in, in uh, Tennessee. Hendersonville. Yeah. Actually, I took a tour in Orlando. They, I forgot what it was called, but they had Bibles uh, dating back I don't know how many years. It was an awesome tour. It was uh, uh, something land. Um, gosh, I forgot the name of it. Near, Di- it was near Disney World. Uh, so they have like, they have a whole they have a whole theme park there, don't they? It was a theme park, yeah. It, and it was. Religious land or something like that. I forgot the name of Bible it. Bible land or Bible land. It could have been Bible land. Bible it was land. really cool. I mean, they had little yeah. shows, and uh, it was a terrible day when we went. It was pouring down rain, but uh, you know, to see these old Bibles handwritten from you know thousands of years ago, it was just incredible. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> well, they go over to Israel and they get they they find stuff like that over overseas. But I mean that's. That's pretty big. If, uh, so I'm really interested in. I haven't been there yet, so I haven't seen the facility. But from what uh, what I've been told, it is um, it's state of the art. They said, "Oh, we really want you to come here because it'll be a, it'll be a much better." No use like ten HD Blu-ray cameras. I mean, it'll be done right. Wow. And, and we'll do post on it. You know, we'll do post production. Yep. It, it'll be a good deal. But so we'll see where this is going to go, Ray. I, yeah. I'm really believing that. Uh, we still have a few years left. Oh yeah, you, know, you got plenty, uh, plenty of time left. Yeah, I mean, you know, we'll you know? just keep doing it until uh, we can't do it anymore. Greg, you know, you know what I find fascinating now, as rock stars get older, most of them are turning to God, and you know, back in the day, like in the '60s and '70s, they wouldn't even talk about religion. You know, that was like out of the question. You know what I mean? They wouldn't let you know sure. which way they're going. Now I interview. I mean, I interview thousands of guys, and it's so cool that everyone opens up to me now. I mean, I, I talked to Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. We talk religion. We talk religion. We talk po- uh, politics. You know, he, he's he's very into the uh, uh, the English. What is it? The, the Catholic Church for England or whatever. Anglican. whatever. Yeah, and uh, he, he loves churches. He visits old churches all over the world, and he's well, that's he fun. Yeah, he carries he carries the Bible and he carries the uh, Quran in his iPhone. He says, but well, to, for these guys to open uh, up like that now, you know, I talked to Lou Graham. We know about Lou. Um, yeah. I, I, I've talked to uh, so many guys now that are, are willing to open up about it. You, you, do you remember um, uh, Frank Marino from Mahogany Rush? That, I, the name is yeah. I don't know Frank, but I know the name. Sure. Frank Marino is is a uh, theologian. Theology. He's in the theology. I mean, he <laughs> he is so much into it. He knows everything. The guy is so well, you intelligent. Know, I I've done a little study myself. I have, I I was ordained in 1975, so I've I've been an ordained minister for many many years. But right, you know, my, mine is music ministry, and I do right. actually on the, uh, just as a soloist. Uh, I am invited to local churches all over the country where oh, I will cool. go in and do a Sunday morning, and I'll I'll really? actually bring a you know a message along with music, mm-hmm. and they're expecting sometimes to get this real guy come in rock, and I come out <laughs> and it's like, wow, I had no idea, uh, and I said, well, that's why I'm here, so you'll have an idea. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> needs an idea. <laughs> but you know, uh, so many so many guys started in the choir too. You know, I mean, um, Ian Gillen from Deep Purple started out in the uh, in a choir. In the, well, the, uh, I did too, and yeah. I was in. Yeah. Uh, of course, when I started young, and the the story is really not. In, well, it'll be in the book, and uh, mm-hmm. the book will be out next year, hopefully. But oh, great! I'm not sure what I'm going to call it. Maybe E to Z or something. <laughs> just uh, because really, my life really 
took the transition in 1970 when I gave my heart to the Lord. And that group, that group that was Gideon's Bible, mm-hmm. which was the secular group, all became E right at that time. And the whole group, the, all the band members, all committed their lives to Christ the same night. It, I, it's a it's an incredible story. It, it's uh, I mean this 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 man. Well, we met this our drummer met this little German lady at this somewhere or another, and she was she said, well, I, you know, she, the Lord spoke to her and said, invite these boys to dinner. And we were all living in a seven bedroom house. We had we had big pink experience. There were a right. dozen of us. Right. Um, we lived in a seven bedroom house, and we our equipment was all set up in the living room and. And every morning, whoever woke up first would go to their instrument and play 2001 Overture and wake the rest of the house up. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and we were vegetarians, and we were studying Eastern philosophy under Paramahansa Yogananda. Wow. And, uh, you know, Shuri Teshwar, Babaji, Paramahansa, you know, Jesus, mm-hmm. of course, was one of the boys in that deal. But uh, And then when we were invited to dinner, this a friend of this little Elfrida was her name, a little German lady spoke broken English. And her, this old man came in. He was about 55. <laughs> old man. <laughs> I'm 20. Yeah. And he walks in the room and he hangs up his coat. And we're all, we had dinner. We were sitting on the floor all philosophizing about God and vegetables because they all, <laughs> they went together in that deal, you know, right, right. in the Eastern philosophy thing. Yep. And we were all vegetarians at the time. And anyway, so he walks in and hangs up his coat and just shouts, praise the Lord. And everybody, like, he sends this vibration through the room. I say that, you know, if you're from, you were in the 60s at all, you understand vibrations. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's another story. But he sent this vibration through the room and stopped the room. And then he began to prophesy to us. He began to operate in a word of knowledge, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He was going right. to tell everybody about their lives, where they've been, what they do, blah, and it was like no condemnation. And he said, you know, you want to know the way? And I said, yeah. He said, Jesus is the way. He said, you know, you want to know the truth? And we would say, Jesus is the truth, he said. He said, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by him. Well, that word penetrated my heart, and there went the guru. You know, it's now, only it, one it, door. So, is, it, is this when you uh, converted or before? Or no, after? this is when I really converted. This I is when you converted. A, um, how do I say this? Um, I had a visitation when I was seven years old. Really? And I was I was given a gift. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what it was. I mean, I I wept. I felt this incredible presence. And then right after that, I could hear harmonies perfectly. And at seven, I was singing harmony with whoever could sing. Perfect harmony. Mm-hmm. I could hear it perfect. And so they would stand us up in front of the, for special deals. They would stand me and Richard Kaiser up in front of us to make us sing Christmas carols. And I'd sing the third. I'd sing harmonies. And uh, I didn't know what it was until I was this. I was a, I went to parochial school, and uh, my second grade teacher, Sister Mary Evelyn, would play piano once a week, and we'd have a piano class, and she would play and sing, and I would sing the harmony, and she would stop. I said, "Who's doing that?" Well, I'm not talking. I'm not, I've got flat knuckles already, you know, from <laughs> I'm not talking. So she, she starts again and then stops us. Who is doing that? And she didn't know. And I'm not talking. <laughs> I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> Finally, she sneaks, she sneaks to be sneaky. She said, Gregory, come up here. So she, she has me stand by the piano. And I, she says, we're going to sing this again, class. And she starts playing, and I'm singing this perfect third. She said, well, where did you learn that? And I looked at her and I said, learn what? I really didn't even know what I was doing. I just couldn't hear it and do it. Yeah. And I believe that I got that gift at that visitation when I was there. Right. And um, uh, so anyway, uh, the rest, I started playing drums at 7, and then a ukulele at 9, and then a tenor guitar at 11. And then uh, my first guitar at 12 and a half was a K guitar. cost $19. The strings were about an inch off of the fretboard. <laughs> oh, yeah. and my cousin and i uh, uh we uh we were singing roy orbison uh mm-hmm. i mean all the early stuff Everly brothers and then yep. the beatles hit in 64 yeah well that was it we became 
the Beatles. But uh, but uh, the Wombats was what we called our, and it was just three of us. We didn't have a drummer. It was, it was uh, well, we did have a drummer, two guitar players and a drummer. And then finally, we found uh, a friend when I was hmm, let's see, I was fifteen at the time, and a friend of ours, Tom Byler, who was uh, we said went to Tom and we said, Tom, we want you to be our bass player. And he said, Okay. So we went out and bought him a bass and an amp. He'd never played before. <laughs> so that's the way it was. And he learned. In two weeks, he learned everything. And uh, so then we signed our first recording contract in 65 with Golden Voice, where Dan Fogelberg, uh, REO Speedwagon, Petra. I mean, it was the premier recording studio in the country mm-hmm. yep. with uh, Jerry Milam. I mean, Jerry built over 300 recording studios in the country. So, And the Wombats was the first band that he ever worked with in that in that studio. And if you go to goldenvoice.com or something, you'll see the Wombats picture, and that's, we're on the front page, I think. But uh, And we did commercials. We did salad dressing commercials. We did Silco Light commercials. We spent 40 hours a week in the studio during the summers because we were all wow. in school. Wow. And Actually... Actually, if you go to www.wombat66.bandcamp.com, you have those Golden Voice recording from 66 through 67 by the Wombat. You know, and you, can, and, you can actually hear it. That is fun. I uh, I have one, and boy, did we we young. And <laughs> <laughs> we used we would play like state fairs and county fairs, and we get mobbed. Wow! I mean, it was it was fantastic. It was just like, what do you do? And we'd let our hair grow all yep. summer long until it got over our ears. And now, with the Wombats, is that when you, you got, were, you know, shared the stage with uh, Janis Joplin and uh, all these other guys? No, that was Gideon's. That was Gideon's Bible. Oh, that was Gideon's yeah. Bible, really? Okay. Yeah, that was Gideon's. And uh, uh, the best, I think the best day, well, the, I don't know, the one with Joplin. And I walked into her dressing room before the, the show and to talk to her. You right. know, it was pretty open back then. Yep. And, uh, you know, God bless her, but she was slumped over a chair. There was a half half a bottle of Southern Comfort that was missing. Of course. Uh, and she was not really coherent, and I'm mm-hmm. trying to talk to her, and she's, what? And so I'm thinking, okay, this is one of my heroes. This is something wrong here. Yeah. So she comes out. We We play. She comes out, and she does 22 minutes and can't finish the show. Really? And 10,000 people tore the place apart. There were only four policemen in the whole Coliseum. And mm. they, it was a riot. Yeah. I mean, and we did, we were heading out the back door. <laughs> and it was the next next week, we're, we're opening for Chicago, which is, a, a you know, these guys were amazing. You know, yeah. they were amazing. Yeah. That's all I can say. And then we did this festival at, uh, this really, it was a small pop festival, you know, back mm-hmm. in, uh, uh, well, I don't know if it was 1969 or 70, but it was Hayworth Pop Festival, and uh, there were 80,000 people there. It was a wow. small festival. <laughs> and yeah. we, of course, we shared the stage with people like B.B. King and, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, I think REO was there. A bunch of people were there, but it was, man, it was out in the middle of nowhere, and it was hippie land. Hippie mm-hmm. land. Which yep. we were, so we fit right yep. in. Well, what what happened the day that you were asked to uh, be the lead singer of Oreo Speedwagon? That's a that's a very interesting question. Um, I had moved to Springfield. I was the the, um, the music leader of a small church. Right. And, you know, we call them pastors today, but I was just the the song leader. I played bass mm-hmm. uh, for that group. But um, I'd moved there. I worked with, my father-in-law was a writer. He had a number of books, and I ran one of his offices. And I did tape duplication and the, the shipping. We had a shipping people there. And I had, had built him a radio booth. I mean, I was, built him a really nice control room. But uh, I worked with him for eight years. But during that time when I first got there, and this was 76, and mm-hmm. well, maybe it was just the end of 75 i'm not sure which it was but so i get a call at one o'clock in the morning you know on a landline back then and i'm thinking something's wrong and i get up and answer the phone and it's uh it's 
it's um, Terry Jamison, who was the owner of Golden Boy Studios at the time, and he said, Greg, I'm, I'm here with the guys from REO Speedwagon. Kevin Cronin just walked out, and huh. we need a singer. They want to know if you'll be the lead singer. So I got on the phone with them, and they said, listen, we know you're a Christian. We just want to know if you'll sing the material. You know, we're making $10,000 a night. You can have money, and you can be famous. Right. And I thought, uh, what? <laughs> That's what I thought. What? That's a tough one. And then uh, I said, guys, uh, and I made a, a really a split second decision. I said, yeah. you know what? I'm I, I'm really uh, honored. I'm flattered. But I said, I, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can sing the material, knowing what I know. Right. And they said, well, okay. So six weeks later, I get a call from Petra, Dan Brock, the manager, in the studio, same studio, six weeks mm-hmm. later, at 1 mm-hmm. o'clock in the morning. Dan saying, Greg, you've got to come and help us, man. This is not going to this is not gonna work unless you come. And I heard a voice saying, you can do this. And so I got on a plane at 7 o'clock the next morning. I flew up there. I sang yep. for 15 hours. I did wow. the backup vocals, all the backups on like six songs, and I did, you know, about three of the lead vocals. And I got back on a plane the next day, and I flew back to Missouri. I, I think I drank 12 Coca-Colas during that <laughs> 15 hours. Don't tell anybody I do that. I don't drink Coca-Colas. <laughs> green tea, baby. Green tea, lemon, and a little grade B maple syrup. So, uh, you know, you, so, you, got, I mean, you, got, a, you got an awesome voice. You have an the awesome voice. The guys would call me periodically and say, hey, we want to fly in for this show in Chicago. It's a big show. We're doing a show with Randy Matthews. We'll come in and, yep. you know, so, okay. So I started really working with them on every date in 1976. And, you know, back then it was a weekend here, a weekend there. Yep. I mean, Bob, when in 1981 it was, uh, this is an interesting part of this. It'll be in the book, of course. But in, <laughs> So in 81, the band had been, Petra had been a band and not a band, a band and not a band, a band and not a band. I think we right. went through a dozen drummers from 76 to 1980. A dozen. And I, don't really, I, I mean, at one time, I was the drummer. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, and after three months, I, I was doing half the lead vocals from the drums. And I said, guys. <laughs> And I, I am a drummer. I was a session drummer in Missouri. I, I mean, I did sessions for Coin Studio. And uh, I said, guys, I, I can't do this. So it, you know, closing again. Then I'm the bass player for the band. And I get a keyboard player and another drummer to do dates because somebody offered something and Bob says, oh, man, it's a great opportunity. You know, we can do this. We get together and rehearse for two days and then go out and do a weekend. And... Uh, so I understand how the whole deal works, but mm-hmm. I really am a singer. I mean, if I can be yeah. free to just go and pick on people, mm-hmm. I don't mean that wrong, but, you know, <laughs> go out there and mess with people, uh, I'm much better off. Because then I get a vibration off the crowd right. and can, you know, know what to do. So so you were, really you were born to be to a do. front man. You are born to be a front man. I was born sure. to be a front man. That's so right. I, Anyway, so, I mean, I worked with the guys really from 76 on, even though I never yep. got the credit for it. I wasn't, quote, a part of the band until 79, but that's not mm-hmm. really true. You know, I did every yeah. date with them from 1976 right. on. In 77, we did 20 dates in 30 days in Arizona Jeez. in four square churches that we were booked at. We were supposed to, this is six guys traveling in a, a box band, hmm. you know. And uh, we did, and we get there, and in every single one of those dates, before the concert, the pastor came up and handed us a check for $100 and said, this will be more than the offering. I wish it could be more. And mm-hmm. we, was, we had a guarantee of 400 for each night, but so much for booking agents. And uh, <laughs> so we got one date in Phoenix, there were about 1,200 people at that show, and we got $400. We were pretty excited about it, but... You know, we slept on floors and sleeping bags. Yep. We did yeah. stuff that people would. Today, it's instant grips. You know, I'm going on television. I'm singing on uh, AGT, and I'm a star now. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. you know, you need to put 40 years behind you and then see what happens. 
<laughs> That's right. Because <laughs> 50 years later, if you're still going, baby, I'll come and I'll I'll write you a check. There you go. <laughs> I, I want to tell our listening audience uh, some numbers here real quick. Petrus sold nearly 10 million copies while being nominated for 13 Grammy Awards, winning four, winning 10 Dove Awards, uh, but I, I guess your your biggest hit, the coloring song, reached the top position on three Christian radio charts simultaneously. And at its peak, the band's tours rivaled Amy Grant in popularity among Christian audiences. Does that sound about right? Well, yeah, we uh, in '85 we were up there like on a we we're in the top 25 of all tours, along with Huey Lewis and the News and the rest of. Them. Incredible I mean, performance was a friend of ours. They loved. We had an average. 7,500 people a night. That's mm-hmm. the average, including doing Bismarck and Sioux Falls and, you know. But, yeah, we uh, we had, uh, and we saw over 10,000 commitments in 1985 mm. in the concerts. They, they came down by the hundreds, and we had counseling room. We had people that could give them Bibles, did follow-up right. on them for 30 right. days. And... Uh, I get, I mean, every once in a while I'll have a man come up to me and say, you know, I'm a pastor today because you led me to the Lord in 1982 mm-hmm. in Saginaw, Michigan, at Saginaw Theater. I have 800 people in my church. I said, really? He said, yeah, thank you. He said, thank God. You know, we're just a conduit. We don't save anybody. We just testify the truth. You and know, the truth be- will, will make you free. Be- because of you guys, we now have bands in churches, which I love. <laughs> I mean, oh dude, yeah, they didn't—they didn't allow <laughs> drums in a lot of those churches. Yeah, either. I love that. You know, <laughs> now, now we got—you know—a full band, a stage, a little bit of lighting. You know, it's—it's it's awesome. It is really awesome. I mean, yeah. the diversity—it's it, just—I think it's fantastic. And you know, I don't personally can't listen to certain styles for a length, any length of time, right? Like, just because they—they're not my cup of tea. But there yep. are. There are many, many people that do. So I say, as Jesus did, when the disciples came to him and said, hey, these guys are doing this stuff, and they're not with us. He said, leave them alone. (laughs) What? Leave them alone. (laughs) (laughs) That's what he said. You know, they thought, well, you got to be a part of us. No, you don't. You just need to be a part of the body of Christ. Many faceted members, you know. And uh, so, I mean, I, I am a body of Christ guy. I, I don't. I don't really. I don't think that there should be walls. I do not, and I believe everyone has their place. They need to find their place in the body and fulfill the call of God on their life. And they and they're going to have to dig in to find that out. They can't. Mm-hmm. It, you can't just motor along. You've got to spend time in the Word. You have really yep. have to press in. You need to spend time in prayer and meditation before the Lord, or you won't hear His voice. But if you do. I guarantee you, he will talk to you, and you'll be glad. What, what do you say to the uh, the people in Syria from a Christian point of view? The, 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 the people that are uh, I weep over that whole deal because I know that it's political. Yeah, and I believe that there are changes that are taking place in the world, in our government. Um, you know, I have a belief that um, God is still in control of this thing, and I, I don't. Un- I don't like the fact of the pain and suffering that goes on that is not merited. But yet, uh, you know, I've had my butt kicked a couple times that I didn't deserve either. You mm-hmm. know, and um, nah, and uh, last January, my wife died on me. In uh, January 14th, it's Sunday night. She's sitting here. And all of a sudden, she has a massive heart attack, and uh, she died three times in the ER. Mm. And uh, they got her back each time, and got stents in there, and she's alive. And it's like, wow. what? So I don't get it. She said, you know, that is the worst thing I've ever felt in my mm-hmm. life. You yep. know, and I said, I understand, but yeah. And I, I don't want to be callous about it, but I, I just don't, uh, I don't have that answer. I don't have the mm-hmm. answer of what to do other than. We can pray that God's will be done on earth right, as it is right. in heaven. I do know that God, that Jesus is revealing himself to people personally in miraculous ways. 
mm-hmm. in the Middle East. Uh, and I have friends that attest to that, people that are there, uh, mm-hmm. people that are, you know, former congressmen, people that are, that know stuff. <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. even want to know. <laughs> Tell me what to pray for, I'll pray for it. Or, you know, you know the Lord will speak to his people. And, and he, if you're one of his kids, and your your ear is tuned, and it wants to be tuned. I'll say just wants to be tuned. You'll hear him. Mm-hmm. Uh, about three weeks ago, the Lord woke me up at three o'clock in the morning. In the middle, it was a hundred and six degrees that day in Dallas, and it was uh, three o'clock in the morning. It was still ninety seven or something like that. And I wake up, and there's something wrong. I don't know what it is, but mm-hmm. there's I know that there's something wrong. Right. So I go to the bathroom. I'm thinking, well, I'll just go to the bathroom. And I go there, and I'm hearing outside of the window, and I said, oh, my God, I know that sound. The compressor on my air conditioning had frozen up. (laughs) So I go out. I Sure enough, I come back in, shut everything off, and it just happened. If I had not been awakened, it would have burned up the whole thing, and it would have cost me 5,000 bucks to replace it. But as a result, I turned it off. You know, it was it was about eighty some degrees. We had to turn the fan on, and I called a friend, and he came out. He said, "I'll be there before noon." He came out. He he had the capacitor in his hand. I, really? He just came from the truck, walked there, unscrewed the thing, plugged this thing, bang, it's up and running. I said, "What what did you just do?" And he said, well, Lord told me it was a capacitor, so I brought the one with me. It happened to be the right <laughs> one." And in ten minutes. It cost me one hundred fifty dollars instead of five thousand. Now that <laughs> that kind of stuff you don't hear about a lot, but he That's true. does that because he wants to show off yeah. to his kids. Yeah. So if you let him be dad and you be the kid, you right. you'll find some you'll find some good stuff going on there. But that you know we true. we find this to be an adventure, uh, Ray. It's mm-hmm. this is an adventure to us. And my wife travels with me everywhere I go. I don't go anywhere without her when I'm on the road traveling at all. So, and that's and she works with the band. She takes care of uh, all the merch for us, free of charge, because she loves what she does. And we don't get paid anything except for what comes in. Yeah. And uh, and I talked to uh, talked to a booking agent just uh, two days ago, a big booking agent to handle like some of the top Christian acts in the U.S. And uh, I need some help, but it's like. I want to see what the Lord might do with this. Mm-hmm. And, and that sounds funny. And I don't mind fielding calls, and I do get calls, and I do field them. And I don't mind doing some of the work, but it'd be nice to have William Morris on board again. But uh, mm-hmm. I doubt if that'll happen. But we'll see. You know what? God knows. He's connecting people is what I'm saying. Yeah, he He's does connect people. people. You're right, you are right about that. Yeah. He is. And if we'll let him do it, and not think that we've got all the answers, yep. and take a little time to wait and pray, yep. then you'll yep. end up with a Kirk Henderson on guitar instead of, yeah. you know, uh, maybe a young kid that doesn't have the experience. And right. Kirk, not only a good guitar player, he's a man of God. Mm-hmm. I mean, he he is the, he's so laid back, so easy to work with, and he uh, he just, you know, he loves the Lord. So there are, I'm telling you, I don't mean this wrong, but there are no stinky butts in this band. Mm-hmm. None. Uh, everybody just gets along extremely well, which is, I just thank God for that. That's fantastic. Well, I, I really hope the album does really well, uh, Back to the Rock too, because it's, it's one of the best out there. And I, I hope people start, I hope you got help promoting the heck out of it. And I'm doing my best. Uh, I'm going to be putting this on like five different music sites uh, YouTube, iTunes. This interview will be go. You know, it'll go everywhere. So I'll, I'll do my part. Cause it, it, well, if it I didn't certainly... say anything wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, guys, censor said you can always edit anything you want. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. And I, I do appreciate everything you've done over the years, bro. I do. Uh, Thank it's, you. It's good to have people that want to get the word out. It's, it's real good. Thank you so much. You're, you're very welcome. Here's a question for you that I ask everybody. It's very interesting uh, what kind of answers I get back. Uh, if you had a Field of Dreams wish, you know, like the movie, to perform or collaborate musically with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? 
Who? Wow. Um, you know, Andre Crouch was a good friend of mine, and I mm-hmm. never got to really do much with him. And because uh, I'm black on the inside, people don't know that, but I really am. <laughs> I'm black on the inside. <laughs> that's a that's a good <laughs> but, thing. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a that's a real good question. I would say that there are probably too many. There are too many people yeah. uh, that that would – I would love to do what I call a taste test. You know, I'd like to do about – with a dozen different people and see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, I really enjoyed the seven months I worked with Bill Kagey. He was a blast. Yeah. You never – he would just start calling out chord changes. You know, <laughs> we would go places. It was a fun time. And we had five lead singers in that. We had five singers, really good singers. Really? So it was like, yeah, yeah. And it was that way in pieces of eight, too. Joe English, of course, he was a, a really good high voice. Mm-hmm. And then Spencer Campbell, who is a, uh, went on to become, well, a director of, the, of music at the University of New Mexico and played with, I don't know how many years he played with Cheryl Crow uh, as a bass player. Great singer. Kirk's a great singer. Mike Demas, who was actually Farrell and Farrell's guitar player, was my keyboard player, good singer. I had five lead singers in that band. And when we, when we went out and played, people, the other bands would just line up on the sides of the stage because they wanted to hear if we were really doing it. <laughs> we were. <laughs> it's good to know you can still do it, bro. Yeah. You, you know who I'd like to see you uh, collaborate with? Kerry Livgren. Well, that's an interesting story because uh, Kerry contacted me uh, not too long ago, and he wanted me to sing, uh, he wanted me to be Joseph Arimathea on his rock opera that he's doing. Oh, wow. And then uh, then some uh, physical ha- problems uh, happened with his wife, and he said, dude, i got to get through this first. Uh, right. His wife is, is uh, uh, dealing with some stuff that... Now, you know, just to get older stuff come, takes place. So yep. I'm, I'm waiting. But, yeah, he, uh, I have an invitation to work with him. He actually asked me to be the lead singer for Kansas back in, uh, it might have been maybe 91. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was in, we was walking in Nashville. No, carry a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a group, a girls group maybe, that was doing Carry On. And they were at Michael W. Smith's Theater in Nashville or uh, club. And Kerry was there as a guest appearance, and I came, came down to visit. And we're walking. He said, well, let's go for a walk. So he said, listen, he said, um, I've been asked to put Kansas back together, and I want to know if you'd be willing to do the lead singing. I said, sure. So uh, he goes back, and Erzing Azoff says, oh, no, Kerry, i, I got to have all the original members, or I won't do this. And Kerry mm-hmm. says, well, I'm not working with Walsh, so I'm out. So yeah. that's just one of those deals. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, it's just one of those deals. But uh, yeah, that'll be another thing. I have a rock opera called Ezekiel that you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier. We did five performances of that. It was like uh, it's like a Jesus Christ superstar. It yep. has, it's got all the elements, and uh, the, the Christian industry didn't know what to do with it, so nothing happened with it. But mm. the the uh, producer and the writer George Atwell. Still, you know, I'm still in contact with George. And I said, George, I still want to do this someday. And we'll beef it up a little. He said, well, that'd be fantastic. He said, I have two more, too, that nobody's heard. I said, okay. <laughs> so, you know, who knows what we can do? Yeah, I think uh, we're due for another yeah. another Christian rock opera. That, that would be awesome. Well, we're, we're uh, about, we're Ezekiel, about ready for it. a guy named, you ever heard of Alan Schwab? He owned the Broadway musical Annie. Yes. He flew, he flew down from New York. Three mm-hmm. days in a row to hear this, to see this show, uh, this Ezekiel performance. And he wanted to put it on Broadway. And he said, now this is the next superstar. And, I, and, and so, the, you know, the lawyers get together and then yep. nothing happens because they, really, yeah. they can't come to an agreement. <clears throat> it's kind of like the, of all the money that comes in from all of the sources for the musicians, only 12% of that. Fifty-four billion dollars a year, yep. goes to the artists. Yeah, that's it. The rest of it, you know. I'm thinking, 
you know, maybe we could get that changed a little bit because without the artists, you know, they don't really make anything, do they? Yeah, it's always yeah. kind of been like that, unfortunately. Yeah, so anyway, maybe yeah. there's some good changes ahead. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Yep. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice to people. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that that's God. That's Jesus's intention. It, it's, you're, that's exactly be, right. I have a. We're big, supposed to be I like him. Big, <laughs> I put a big typed up banner over my mirror years ago. It says, "Be nice." There, there's too many nasty people out there. Someone's got to well, be you nice. No, there's no reason to be ugly. Come on. No, there is no reason. You know. I mean, unless you don't know the Lord, then I understand why you know you could be a stinky butt. But yeah, uh, yeah. No, there's no reason. I mean, we're nope. blessed brother we are blessed and if you yeah. just take a little time and count the blessings um and your worst fears you know almost never happen to you you know i think you're the right ones the enemy tries to beat you up with at night when you're laying in bed trying to go to sleep and you think yeah. all the stuff that could happen stop yeah. just stop. True. stop it that's true so, i was uh just a, uh, as a closing thing i i was lo- somebody asked me for oh this is my daughter uh, my oldest daughter who is an actress and a and she's a teacher. She has a acting school, actually. Mm-hmm. And she gets these young kids, you know, these deals with Russell Crowe and with whatever. She's very good at what really? she does. Huh. And she's handling them, I'm, the media for us. She put a website together for us. She's in her spare time, quote, I said, what spare time? And, uh, but anyway, she, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to tell you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> People are helping. <laughs> Hey, how, how, real quick, how many grandchildren do you have? Uh, fourteen. Are you kidding me? No, nope, fourteen grandkids. Wow, that is incredible. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I could be a great grand. I could be a great grandfather very easily. Older that is incredible. I've got four, and I'm happy. <laughs> well, you know, uh, they live all over. I mean, they're all yeah. over the place. But yeah. uh, we love them. You know, yeah. Oh, you me know, too. And, and my, of course, my biggest prayer is that they'll get it. You know, there's yeah. a place where, you know, because of the society and the whole digital age and uh, yeah. the web and everything, there's so many distractions. I know that take know. you away from what's the heart of the matter. And, and what's uh, really important. It, on, yeah. on the back of the T-shirts uh, that we take on the road, it has a CPR logo, and on the mm-hmm. back it says. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Nice. And um, so, I my my wife's cardiologist said I'm I will be gladly wear that T-shirt. Sure. <laughs> he said because I understand this, and he understands. He he came in after he came in uh, the next morning in ICU, and I'm sitting in there, you know, after a long night. And he looked at he looked at my wife and he said, "You know, you died on me last night." He said, "You know, I've been doing this a long time, and I know that prayer changes a lot of things. And I know mm-hmm. that that only God could do this. You should have yep. died. You really shouldn't have made it." And uh, I thought, well, you know, when your when your number is up, your number is up. But if it's not, yeah, yep. And I mean, I got her to the hospital. She was at the hospital within nine minutes, and the doctor wow. was across the street. And he said, if you'd have been here 10 minutes later, this would have been a whole different outcome. But she's doing great. And and she's a nice gal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, what kind of nice. symptoms did she have before she uh, had the heart attack? Did she have any symptoms? Oh, just being tired, just pooped, like just no energy. And she had 100% blockage in the main artery. They call it really? the Widowmaker. And oh, uh, it just, you know, it's like, and here's the fun part. A month before... She had been to her former cardiologist and went through the whole test, stress test, the whole you know thing, and looked at the EKGs and this and I said, you know, they look pretty good. Things look pretty good. One month later, bam. So when this doctor, this new doctor, came in, he said, I want you to know I am your new cardiologist. <laughs> yeah. words, this is not going to happen again. And he loves the Lord. That's a good part of it. Right. Um, Pam was telling me that she said, I said, I remember waking up on the table and she said, I, I, she said, I did see the most incredible, brightest light I have ever mm-hmm. seen in my life. Mm-hmm. But uh, she said, I woke up on the table, I looked up and there was this little nurse looking down at me and she said to the nurse, she said, do you love Jesus? 
And the nurse said, yes, I do. And everyone else in this cath lab loves Jesus. And we just prayed for you, and you're in, you know, you're in God's hands. She mm-hmm. said, okay. So, I mean, and then he put the stents in, and she's getting the oxygen. <laughs> oxygen is a good thing to get to your, yeah. you know, into your blood. So, yeah. And she's doing very well, and she's uh, walking every day. She had 12 weeks of rehab, cardio rehab, which I don't think I could do 45 minutes of cardio rehab three days a week. And I'm a, I'm a runner. I'm a, you know, but, eh, yeah. I still play golf, though. I still go out and hit the ball. <laughs> hey, golf is okay. It's good. <laughs> it's good exercise. I love, I love to play yeah. golf. Yeah. It's maddening. Did, did you play, uh, I, let's see, did you play with, um, well, Perry Como was probably, were you too young at the time to play golf? Or? I played with Pat. I played, played with, with Pat. Pat. I have a standing invitation to play with him anytime right. I'm out in, in California. Uh, but there are other people that I've met over the years that are, you know, were well, they are professionals that play on the mm-hmm. tour. Yeah. And I've gotten some, my swing tweaked. I play pretty good. I'm probably a six, maybe a six handicap. That's excellent. And uh, not too bad. Yeah. I, I had a really good round. Last year I was playing, it was a high, Hank Haney course. They have an academy up the road. It's a hard course. And it was one of those days, and Pam likes to go with me sometimes. If it's her day off, she'll, she'll come ride the cart. And... I shot a 63. I shot. And I had nine. I was nine under par. Wow. I was, I was brain. I was just totally out of my mind. That's it crazy. It didn't matter where I was. The ball was going in the hole. Huh. Tipping in from off the green, 30 foot putt. That's and when my playing partner Jerry just looked at me and said, "You know, I, I got it. I got it." <laughs> Something. I said, "I'm keeping this scorecard." <laughs> That's the lowest <laughs> round I've ever shot. Have it bronze. <laughs> have it bronze. Yeah. It was pretty. Spe- it was pretty special, but. That's you know not who you, normal, normal. You know who you need to play with is Alice Cooper. Well, I was thinking of uh, Eddie Van Halen personally. Okay, because he, he's Eddie better than Alice. Play. And you know what? I've I've met him before. Uh huh. Uh, back in the E band days, and I was uh, we were, my hometown was Peoria. He was playing this this rock club in Peoria, and the promoter was working with us on something else. And this was. Uh, so we all go to this show, and it's, you know, the wild, uh, uh, I don't know, the old days when he would be sit in the electric chair and the whole deal, you know. Mm-hmm. So we go back stage afterwards, and we're talking to him, and I'm thinking, he's talking to me like a regular guy. It's like, what do you mean? Your dad's a pastor? Yeah, my dad's a pastor. He's just talk- We're talking away. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. And I thought, you know what? Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he gets old, he will not depart from it. So what happens is, is that that you may go, you know, people may end up in La La Land for a while, which people do, right. and you may have a bad stretch. But the truth is, that seed inside of you that's been planted there, that the Holy Spirit, it will, it's not going to die. You can't kill that thing, mm-hmm. and it will, it will eventually, it will burst forth again yep. at the appropriate, at the appointed time. I'll say. And when it does, then your life will change again. Sure. I mean, I had a couple rough years uh, myself where I felt mm-hmm. like I was just in a pit. But I always knew that God loved me, and I always knew I'd come out of it, but I just didn't yep. know when. I think and, we all uh, have. Then, <laughs> then when, it was like, and then when I, and then I did, it was like I was born again, again. Yep. And, uh, but that was a, that's another story. That'll be in the book. Good. <laughs> it's a wild, it was a pretty wild ride, but it's good to be back, as they say. Well, we're we're glad you're back. And uh, yeah, well, it's been, hey, I've been back for twenty what, twenty four years, so yeah. I'm good. I'm 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 back. You know. Well, yeah. make make sure you play some golf when you come to Florida. You know. We, we got well, now players. that's a thought. Uh, there are people that have asked me to play. I don't know if I'll bring mm-hmm. my clubs or not, but maybe when uh, when in November, November, just uh, you know, maybe text text me your cell number and make sure I've got your email address. That, okay. Uh, do do you play? Yeah, I play. I you know I, I shoot in the nineties. I mean, I'm not. That's fine. You know. <laughs> I I shoot in the nineties sometimes. Just on the front nine. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I love to play. It's a great game. <laughs> it's a good game. Yeah. Yeah, we can get together. There's uh, uh, Dan's uh, old partner Brian wants to play too. Okay. So we we'll uh, get a foursome together. We can get a foursome. We yeah. can kick it around. 
I maybe get Dick Mask. He's still down there. Dick, you know, is a senior tour guy. He still mm-hmm. plays really good. He's in Winter Garden. Um, so, I mean, there are people I call. I like to play. You know, the reason I like to call them is because they can get you on anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're playing with a professional? Yes. Well, that'll be $10. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 got, we, we got some really fancy uh, courses around. I, I live right between Bradenton and, and uh, Sarasota. And oh, my gosh. Called, it's called Lakewood Ranch, and they, they've got um, some really, you know, really uh, exclusive courses in this area. That are really, well, really you nice. know, that's very interesting. I'm going to be calling you because uh, okay. we have some stuff working in Clearwater that, that is yep. not too far away. Nope. And. Um, yep. Very close. I can always rent a set of clubs. I'll bring my shoes and gloves and ball. Just rent some clubs, okay. too. You know, or if you've got an extra set, and uh, you can just uh, bring those along. Just don't so. embarrass me too much. <laughs> we, no, 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 no. I, you know, I usually I, you know, make, you know, two or three birdies around, and then depending on the yep. buggies, you know, depends on the I'll course, get lucky once in a while. <laughs> I do, too. I just enjoy the game because it, it is a great challenge. It is. So. Well, we'll do that. We will play some golf. Sounds good. I'll. I'll. Uh, I guess I can send my email information to Dan. Dan the man. Yep. Okay. Well, you can I'll send it that. to me. My my e- my uh, my email address is greg at gregxvols dot com. That's easy. Yep. Greg at gregxvols dot com. I'll make sure I, uh, I send you an email with all the information. And get it to me. Yeah. And okay. we'll, I'll keep in contact with you. We All that right, way. I appreciate we'll that, Greg. We'll definitely make sure that you got uh, you've got tickets for the uh, for the concert. Uh, oh yeah, Lakers. definitely. That'll be a lot of fun. That's a great. It'll show. be fun. It'll be yep. great. Greg, thank you so much, man, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it for all the awesome music you've given us and continue to bring. And uh, I'll see you, I'll see you up there in uh, at the show, brother. Okay, we'll do. Blessings. Okay. Good luck to you. Good luck to you too. Bye bye. God bless you. Bye-bye. Be sure to catch uh, Classic Petro with David and the Giants Friday, September 21st, 7 o'clock at Victory Church in Lakeland, Florida. Order God Only Knows by Greg Voltz, his uh, solo album. And Back to the Rock 2, Five Stars All the Way by the CPR uh, CPR Band uh, at Amazon.com incredible album. For more information about Greg Voltz, visit www.gregvoltz.com or www.facebook.com backslash Greg X Voltz and www.cprband.rocks. Very special thanks to Dan the Man of White Thorn Events for arranging this interview with Greg Voltz and of course the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom. BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of the Ray Shasho Show. And if you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me, the Ray Shasho Show at gmail.com. Don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, the true story of an eclectic American family and their wacky family business available now at Amazon.com. I promise you will live it. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio, Station 1.